Welcome and welcome back everybody, Tabletop Toki here, and today, um, <laughs> it's a little bit of an impromptu stream, but I recently finished a cull of my collection, so there are some games there that I need to get off my shelves, and there are some games that I just have, ooh, there's a the mic. <laughs> so, let me see if this is plugged in. Okay. So <laughs> there are some games that I need to get off my shelf um, and there are some games that I had extra copies of. So um, I'm going to just go through which games I'm getting rid of and why, what they are. If y'all are interested in any of them, let me know. Send me a DM on Instagram or Board Game Geek or what have you um, and we'll get to it. But while we're doing that, I figured I would do a Lost Guild. So the first uh, little house that I ever built was this clothing fabric shop which was really fun and I haven't built one of this size I did one on stream the other day for the train station I believe it was um, but that was a little bit larger so today I have two options we have this um, I think it's a tea shop um, or a medicine shop or something and then I also have this ramen shop so I'm not sure which one I'm gonna do. <laughs> if you guys have any suggestions, one you'd like to see, they do look surprisingly similar. Um, I do think a benefit of the ramen one is it has this cute little ramen bowl on top, and the um, what you call it? The one. It looks like it just has yeah some tea on top or something. So between those two, this one does have a little bit more greenery though. Um, yeah, but I figured it would be fun to try to build one of those here and talk about some games um, instead of just <laughs> doing a stream where I just talk the whole time or just a stream where I just build the whole time. Um, but I think we'll probably do the ramen shop today. I picked two bad shops. It's very warm here. I don't know what the weather is like by y'all, but <laughs> um, yeah, thinking about having ramen right now or tea. Maybe not the best choice. Maybe like an iced tea or something. Um, and there aren't too many. So we have our stickers here and then just three bags. So I'm just going to open those up. And once those are open and sorted, I'll start talking through some of the games that are on the um, coal pile. So I have a picture of them up here <laughs> um, that I was finally able to get organized and yeah, I would love to hear if any of y'all are have ever sold games or are thinking about it and if there's a frequency, like I know some people every year try to go through their collection and sell, but some people don't want to sell at all, they just want to keep all their games. And some people I know just are constantly acquiring new games and selling them. Um, for me, I usually like to try to do two big serious coals per year, um, and that just, I mean, I don't know, having been in the hobby for quite some time now, um, your taste in games changes, and during that time, games themselves also change pretty drastically, so, um, things that, like, were great maybe five, ten years ago, may still be pretty good games, but there might be other games that have kind of replaced them since and what have you. All right, just checking to make sure that there aren't any extra pieces trapped in here. Okay, cool. I was getting anxiety about this, just like when I punch things, like I can see that there's nothing else, but I'm always worried that I'm missing something. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna start sorting. Here's the picture of what it'll look like when it's finished. Here's again the size of what this one will be when we're done with that. So I'm just going to set that off to the side over here as well. Um, and then this is what we'll work on starting to start. So, all right, looking at the games that are going to be called, I'll just go from like the very topmost left corner here. Um, so up on the top, and if I miss one, please let me know and I will... <laughs> Do my best to go back to it, or if you want more info on one of the games, let me know. So we have uh, Dungeon Drop. So this one is actually one that I do have in my collection. Um, this is an extra copy that I had found. It's a game where you're going to be um, 
basically taking a bunch of cubes that represent different parts of a dungeon, shaking them up and dropping them out. And then based on where the cubes fall on the table, you have to like get certain cubes with patterns. You get unique um, items and class, or you have a unique class and character. So um, it's very, you know, D&D &D dungeon fantasy-esque. Um, which makes it pretty fun for the replayability. Like some of them you can flick cubes, some of them you can group cubes differently, some of them have different scoring for different types of cubes. It just depends. Um, but it's a pretty fun one. I've never seen a game that uses that mechanic of just like drop everything on the table and that's your unique setup. So that's pretty cool. And the copy that I have, I also have the expansion, which is called Dropped Too Deep, I believe. And it includes like a cooperative mode. Um, the game itself plays actually multiplayer and it also plays really well solo. That's actually my preferred way to play it. But it's just like a really light, quick game. There are a lot of fun mini expansions for it. Um, but I have an extra copy. And <laughs> so I talked about this a little bit earlier on Discord, but Oftentimes I have like a compulsion when it comes to finding good deals on game. And I think like, oh, either I'll gift it or there will be somebody that wants it. And then I can get them like a good deal on the game in advance by purchasing it when it's cheap. <laughs> so um, that's why I have an extra copy of Dungeon Drop there. Um, I actually had like three or four copies and um, the other ones are spoken for, but this guy, um, hasn't been claimed yet, so that's that one. Um, right next to that, it looks like it's Blood of the Englishman. This is another one that I do have multiple copies of, so I have my copy and this is an extra. So this one is a two-player asymmetric game where one person is playing as um, like Jack from Jack and the Beanstalk, more or less, and um, the other person is playing as a giant. So the giant's trying to get cards with the letters fee, fi, fo, and thumb all in a line and Jack is trying to arrange the cards based on their numbers to create like a beanstalk to get up and get certain treasures. Um, again, this one's a pretty unique card game. Um, it's just cards and it's really 50 player aids so that the asymmetry isn't too crazy. Um, but it's truly asymmetric <laughs> in that, well, there are a lot of games that say they're asymmetric where you have like this but this play style is the same in this game you actually are able to do different things based on your character so the play is asymmetric the win condition is asymmetric um, and it's a really cool one it's one that i don't usually hear a lot about and some people have said that like it's slightly imbalanced with one of the characters being slightly easier I forgot. you can also it's just quick enough that you can also just play like the two games back to back um with uh, one person is one character and then vice versa, kind of similar to the recommended play for other asymmetric games like Jekyll versus Hyde or Root and things like that, except this one is much faster, I think, than either of those two. So that is that one. Um, underneath it is Unbroken. So this is one that I have in my collection, um, but I um, am going to be letting go of it. Um, it is a dungeon crawl type of game, which <laughs> I I have a lot of those. It's a solo game. Um, and for me personally, uh, I'm just going to set these off to the side a little bit. Um, for me personally, I have a lot of solo games um, in my collection at this point. I have quite a few of these like dungeon crawl type games as well. And I think that the out of them, this one is fairly light um, and fairly quick. It's got a lot of variability with the different monsters and what have you, but I think um, for me, I like a little bit more that's not focused on story and more focused on like some hardy mechanics. So compared to something like Set a Watch, even though um, Unbroken play is much faster than Set a Watch does and is much lighter. I think I prefer if I'm gonna sit down and set up for a like dark high fantasy theme solo experience, I tend to lean towards playing, wanting to play something a bit chunkier. Um, so that's why I'm letting go of that one, but I really enjoyed my time with it. Um, it's one that I used to bring to work as well because it's like quick enough that you can play on a work break. Um, <laughs> so that one, unfortunately, 
didn't make the cut this time around. Um, I think I've enjoyed it enough. The next one is Midland, which I absolutely have a copy of, and it is a super, super fun one. Um, so Mega Land is kind of similar to if you've ever played Machi Koro, where you're building a little engine of cards that you can purchase after a um, like resource collection round or what have you. But unlike Machi Koro or like Space Base, for example, where you're going to be rolling dice and it's based on the luck of the die roll, there's actually a push your luck element to it. So during the push your luck phase, you're going out as an adventurer and you're trying to gain treasure for each new encounter that you go on but you're also going to be taking damage from monsters that you encounter so once you get to that buy phase you can use the treasures that you collect to purchase um new buildings which will give you unique powers and scoring or you can use sets of the same item in order to purchase more health so that you can push further on future adventures. This one is really, really cool. Um, I think it's a, like a really easy one to pick up on, easy to teach, quick to play, very fun. The push your luck is always interesting to see the reveal of, you know, which um, cards come up when and if someone's lucky, if they end up dying because they push like one card too far. Um, one of the fun cards in this one too is there's a killer rabbit that takes away a lot of health, but once you get to the rabbit, if you um, survive and you have carrots, which are one of the treasures you can accumulate, you can trade in three carrots to the rabbit to like appease it and get some other treasures. So there are a lot of fun little things with this one. Um, and again, uh, this is one that I'm keeping in my collection. This is just an extra copy that I've picked up. And again, this one I've gifted so many times or, you know, gotten cheap copies for people. And this is just one of the leftovers. Um, and speaking of which, like this leftmost pile is mostly that. Um, so the next one below it is Flip Ships. And I'll talk about that in conjunction with Space Invaders, which is below that as well. So these are um, a series of dexterity games designed by Kane Klenko. Love them. <laughs> what a legend. Um, so these are games kind of similar to, um, what's the name of the old space game? Is it Space Invaders? Probably, um, where you have different aliens descending and you have to move your ship and shoot at different ones. Except in this game, you're gonna actually be flicking your ships onto the cards. So when they land on them, um, you're gonna be able to damage them and stop them from crashing into the earth. <laughs> um it's a really really fun one flip ships is one of my favorite dexterity games just the theme the artwork quan chi moria beautiful <laughs> you'll love to see it um oh and these are almost all sorted cool so uh this one is really really great the original is flip ships and then i'm not sure if they just thought it would be more marketable with the Space Invaders theme or if they got the IP, but it's now printed as Space Invaders and I think Flip Ships is out of print actually. Um, but this is again an extra copy, especially games that are out of print. Um, I always try to pick them up because you never know if and when you're going to see them again. <laughs> so it's always good to have them just in case. And let's see what's the next one Ooh, we have some little I don't know what this is like a little hammer type thing um the next one in between is Haven which is a two-player game and I actually talked about this on my underrated two players games list from February uh but in case you missed that video um no oh, there's the little people pieces we'll just put them here for now um it's a game where it's got a little bit of elements of area control, but it also has, um, whatchamacallit, some like card play. So you're trying to meet certain thresholds with your cards. Um, we're almost unsorting. Looking good. I'm just going to put all these together, actually. Um, so you can either go for lore bonuses, which will gain you these like lore tokens, or you can go for um, combat bonuses, which will let you take control of certain areas on the map. Um, it's a really unique two-player game, one that I really enjoy. And again, 
this one is an extra copy. <laughs> so going on to the next stack, stack number two, um, this is more of the ones that I am going to be letting go from my collection. Um, so I'm just going to get a quick drink here. Um, we have Skyward, which is on top. It's the brown box. This is an I Cut You Choose game, which prior to recently, I didn't have a whole lot of options for I Cut You Choose. Um, and it's got gorgeous art. So I really wanted to hang on to it. But unfortunately, this one only plays to four. And I have other I Cut You Choose games that do play to more players now. So this one hasn't really hit the table recently. Um, but essentially, you're um, drafting cards in the I Cut You Choose style in order to build up an engine and get end game scoring bonuses. It's got a really cool futuristic space adventure type of theme, kind of utopia design where all the buildings are very colorful as well. Um, it's a really gorgeous presentation, but um, like I said, unfortunately, it's just not getting played because of the player count. It's pretty rare that we have a four player game night. Um, and when we do, we usually end up defaulting to something a little chunkier. So, um, but a really interesting one as far as I cut you choose games. I feel there aren't enough of those out there, um, at least not that I've seen. Okay, let's see. We've got our gray pieces. Laws, laws, cool. We're gonna put those side by side, and then we're gonna build up this base here with a long light gray. Um, next to Sky is the it's a Helvetique game, and it is it's got one of the most unique themes of a game that I've seen, which is you you know how you can fog up a window with warm breath and then draw on it. So it's about making those little like fog drawings and rearranging them. Super cute theme, really fun little puzzle. Um, however, I think it's definitely a great game for. Uh, kids or if you want a really light game. For me personally, after a couple of plays, it felt very samey um, and very, like I said, light. So I felt myself defaulting to similar strategies each time. And again, it's not necessarily like the weight of game that we are necessarily looking for when we have a game night. Um, so that one will be leaving, although it's super charming and um, very, I would say the word is endearing. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. And what is under that? There's just a copy of Uno there that I'm not even sure. I think it came with some other games. So there's that. Um, and underneath that is Broken and Beautiful. This is another one that I have multiple copies of. Um, this game is about Kintsugi, which is a Japanese aesthetic or um, technique in pottery um, and kintsugi um, just like as a general principle where are these other little gray pieces uh oh um there's one <laughs> so kintsugi is a process where when pottery breaks instead of trying to repair it or replace it you actually um highlight the cracks in the pottery using gold and so this game deals with that idea. You're breaking certain items that you get and then reforging them with gold that you collect throughout the game. I think it's a really cool way of highlighting this particular aesthetic. Um, and uh, it's certainly one of the two games I have in my collection that has to deal with Kintsugi. <laughs> um, so I don't know, maybe we'll be seeing more games. Um, about Kintsugi in the future. Um, but this is one of them. It's pretty light. It's a really small box, which is nice. So it's very portable. I think there was a Kickstarter version with very um, like fancy pieces, but this is just the retail version and that's what I have as well. Okay, um, next to that, we have Grifters. So this is a four player card game. Um, it's an interesting one because you program your cards and then they go out of cycle and kind of cycle through. So there are ways of manipulating your deck. It's, I don't know that it's full deck building, but it kind of feels like a deck builder because you're getting new agents and then you're having to try to get them out of your discard or out of their um, inactive portion or cycle. Um, 
It's a pretty interesting one. It's got a really cool theme and I really love the art. But again, for me, four players is the maximum player count for this one. Um, we played it again recently, not too long ago. Um, and it didn't, uh, oh, these are weird. These aren't the same pattern. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think it's one that I'll be hitting the table much anymore, although I love the art and theme. So that one's up for grabs now too. <laughs> um, and next to that, well, below that we have Kodama, um, Spirits of the Forest, I believe is the full title. This is um, a game that's actually based on a game called Kigi from, I believe it's Daniel Solis. And I originally bought Kigi through drive Through Cards. They're um, a website that does self-publishing for board game designers. Um, Kigi has really beautiful Japanese style, like brush strokes that um, Daniel did themselves. And it was the game that I got first, and then eventually it was so good that it got picked up by indie games. Um, and they made the published version with some Quan Jai Moria art called Kodama. Um, I just have a lot of love for the very <laughs> for the very original one since I had that first, and since it's a self-published game. But essentially they're similar where you're gonna be drafting different branches that have elements on them. So maybe like mushrooms or butterflies or what have you. Um, and then you can also get um, objective cards or each season there will be different objectives and you're trying to grow your tree out. So you actually lay it down and then the branches go out organically. Um, it's a really cool concept, but like I said, Having the original version, Kigi, the art is a little bit more minimal and the gameplay is as well. That's the one that I decided to keep out of the two, um, but there's a lot more content for Kodama, a lot more replayability with it being like a fully published version. <laughs> um, but for my preferences, I um, kind of like the pared down version and first having a little part of game. And underneath Kodama is Lanterns. This is a, I feel like at least it was pretty popular um, of a game. Uh-oh, do I have two of these black, uh, dark grapes? I think, am I missing one? Oh, um, I had my dark gray pile over here, but <laughs> it's looking like I might have, did I misplace one perhaps? That is also, oh, yep. So these here should actually be the little hooks. That's why. Um, where were we? Lanterns, right. So Lanterns um, is a tile laying game and it's a pretty interesting one because when you lay down your tile, you get lanterns for matching colors um, for the different ones on the board. But based on the orientation of the tile, the other players also get lanterns based on the color of the firework that you, tile that you lay down. So it's, um, uh oh, how do I get this one off? Last time I did a stream, y'all helped me out by <laughs> pointing out that there's that the, the actual tool for getting these on and off, but this one doesn't seem to want to cooperate. Maybe if I take off this piece, it'll help work. Um, so Lanterns is pretty, um, pretty clever in its design. It was a game that I got earlier on in my board game career. And um, I do definitely give it props for the how it affects other players on your turn. It really forces you to be cognizant. Well, if you want to be very competitive with it, to be cognizant of what um, sets other players might be going for and the timing of getting certain bonuses. Um, there was an expansion called Emperor's Gifts that I talked about in one of my burn videos because the base game is just so elegant in its implementation. But Adding that to it, I really felt like muddied it up. Um, so here we are many, many years later. And, and again, being mostly uh, a four player game, I don't find it hitting the table quite as much as it used to. So hoping that it'll pass on to somebody <laughs> who um, will be able to play it more and appreciate it and discover kind of how great of a base game it is. 
Um, and you know, there are probably some people too that might like it enough that they wanna get the expansion as well. Um, so that one is Lanterns. And next to those games, we got like three white games in a stack under Broken and Beautiful. So there's Welcome to the Dungeon and Welcome Back to the Dungeon. These are some pretty cool push your luck games where everybody's gonna be looking at cards, building up a dungeon, and then you have a hero that you're gonna be going through. And the last person to go out of the round is going to get all the um, equipment and everything that's placed into the middle. So it could be like equipment to help them out. It could be monsters which damage their health. And you're trying to hedge your bets on when you think the dungeon is, uh, when you think you could be successful in flipping over all of those components. Um, and surviving. It's a really cool game, a really great design. The only problem with it is, is that I now own Stu from Button Shy Games, which has a similar concept and comes in a wallet. So even though Welcome to the Dungeon is very portable, um, I tend to, I, the wallet is even more portable and I do like the theme and art of Stu a little bit better. Um, that one is from Jason Glover and he did, I believe he did the art himself, um, which is standard for a lot of his games. And the, ex or the sequel, Welcome Back to the Dungeon, is very similar. It just has some new, um, different like armors and things and, um, different cards, obviously, and characters. And under those two is Bandata, um, from Chase Estep. So this is a one to two player game, absolutely gorgeous art. In fact, I'm pretty sure um, Chase sourced all of the art from um, books he found that were like public domain or public domain images from books at a library, which is insane because the game itself is just so absolutely gorgeous. Um, but it is a game where you're gonna be manipulating different dice in order to try to feed your little birdies. There are some unique scoring things along with that. Um, and it's a really gorgeous game. It's fairly compact. This one for me, for whatever reason, just didn't quite grasp me as much as I thought it would. Um, I think the two player feels like a lot of back and forth and the solo with manipulating dice. I think it could be an interesting puzzle, but it just didn't quite click with me. I think the weight of it and just the outcome being manipulating dice didn't quite register in my brain as far as the theme goes. Um, but I know that it's a favorite of a lot of people, especially to play solo. It's also on Board Game Arena, I believe. Um, so uh, people are able to try it out there. But yeah, I don't, um, this is one of the ones that I backed on Kickstarter. Uh, I believe it was a print and play before that, but I'm having a hard time remembering because it was a while ago. <laughs> and after showing it to a lot of people and playing it solo for a bit, um, I'm realizing again that it's just not hitting the table as much. Um, my solo time these days is pretty limited and when I do have time to play a solo game then I'm usually learning or um, prepping or refreshing rules uh, for a video so um, already having limited time to kind of do that and then limited ooh, limited time to um, play it's I'm finding that a lot of these games that even if they're pretty solid games, just I don't have the time that I used to, um, which being that <laughs> the, the perk is that that's because I get to make videos and like share games with y'all and try a lot of new games. I think it's a good problem to have, um, but it's hard to justify keeping all those games in my collection when I don't get to play them regularly. So that's why Bandata is gonna be uh, leaving here shortly. And let's see, underneath those games, the big blue box is Grim um, Masquerade. This is a deduction game and it is absolutely gorgeous. It's got a um, theme of a uh, different um, Grim fairy tale, uh, Brothers Grim fairy tales. And um, basically, you're going to a ball and you're trying to figure out who everybody is. Um, 
And you do that by getting items that pertain to each character. So for um, Sleeping Beauty, for example, the item I believe is like the glass slipper. And you can put items in front of characters and if they get a certain number of their own item, they're found out and then they have to leave the ball. But if you identify them incorrectly and they get too many of an item, they actually get a power that they can then use going forward. So it's a really interesting one. You can have a lot of tactics as far as trying to trick people into thinking you're one thing and not the other in order to get more items and have more flexibility with your turn. Um, but uh, as far as deduction games go, it plays to five. Uh, typically when we have five and we want to play a deduction game, we end up playing cryptid, um, which I have some feelings about because sometimes I get a little cryptid -ed out, cryptid -ed out. <laughs> Uh, but um, that is kind of the preference of the group and Grim Masquerade doesn't get played as often. Um, so that's why that one's leaving. But again, oh, it pains me because it's so gorgeous. Okay, moving on to step four, we got our little base here. And actually I might change the focus on that. Nope, that looks pretty good. Oh, it's so shiny, <laughs> great. So we have to build up a second layer. We have some little flowers here. Okay. Oh, wait. Yes, that's correct. Um, moving on with the game sale game. So under Grim Masquerade, we're in the second column um, from the left now. Uh, so the brown box is Corrosion. And this is a little bit of um, an engine building game. I really love the concept of this one because you are going to be getting different cards that you can play that will help you produce um, resources like steam. Um, and fun is it has or games like that where you have a wheel and then you put things kind of like grifters where you put things into rotation and as they rotate around you have to wait for them to become active again or like the more they are the better result that you get when they finally do trigger um it is a really cool concept i love the timing on those things um but i think for me the theme doesn't grab me quite as much with it being kind of like it's not really steampunk it's just steam stuff <laughs> um let me see which piece this is this has a little extra doodads on the front um so yeah the theme isn't quite uh didn't quite grab me although i think the mechanics are very interesting and um unfortunately being that it is uh, that you can play up to four players it's um Oh, this goes on like one, but not the other. Interesting. Um, it doesn't hit the table as much. Plus for me, I don't know if it was just because we played with newer players, but when I had played it previously, it did feel like it ran a little bit long for my tastes. Um, so that's why that one's leaving, unfortunately. And I do have to say again, that one's a little bit of a shallow one because it's mostly about the theme. Um, because I do really, I, I did enjoy the mechanics and I wish that, um, the game had a little bit more, what's the word, like weight to it in terms of how I feel playing it. And yeah, so, um, again, I think it's a good problem to have that there are so many varied games with different types of themes <laughs> so that it's like a uh, very privileged. I feel like people who got or who are in the hobby now are very privileged in that if you like the mechanics of something but not the theme you can probably find another game that's similar mechanically that has a theme that appeals more to your sensibilities so um i'm oh these are different pieces i'm in no way complaining about that it just wasn't for me <laughs> and at the bottom of that stack um, second column is Alone. Uh, this is a game that I purchased kind of impulsively at a board game auction and it is a dungeon crawler. It's a one verse all game where one person is a hero trudging through the dungeons and then everybody else is playing as the like monsters in the dungeon um, trying to make sure that they don't escape. Pretty cool concept. I remember when it was announced, I was pretty 
excited because that sounded unique, but, <laughs> and I knew this going in, um, the heat of the moment just gripped me. And again, it's hard to turn down when it's a good deal. Um, I'm not a fan of one versus all games. There are very few and far between that I will play willingly. Um, not Alone is one of them where one person is an alien trying to assimilate the crew of a crashed spaceship onto their planet or into their planet, I should say. Um, and other than that, it's not one that I tend to enjoy. Typically, it's like the one is the person who has the most experience with the game. And being that I have a problem with acquiring new games and loving to teach games, that one usually ends up being me. It feels really bad if you're the one and you know the game the best and you end up winning. Um, but it also sucks to constantly be in that position and never be able to be part of the team and <laughs> celebrate in like shared victory with people. So um, again, that's nothing against the game. I've heard really good things. It's just that knowing me, I don't think that it's necessarily um, something that I would particularly enjoy. Um, as much as I would hope to. So that's why Alone is leaving. Ooh, okay, we're making progress. So now we have this third little skinny stack from the left. Um, on top is Rumble in the House. This is just a really quick little party game. Um, it's a pretty fun one. I collected it along with um, Rumble in the Dungeon as well because the art's really cute and um, it's really just a little party game. But being that it's just a little party game, we don't really play it. So that's why that one's up for grabs. Um, and then moving along, under that we have Bag of Chips. That one is a, hmm, how do you explain it? Uh, you have chips and you program ones that you're going to hold on to that you think will um, help you score at the end of the game. So each round you reveal new scoring cards. And then you have chips that you're going to program in like over, under, something like that. Um, but, uh, whoa, okay, this has a green and a pink. Okay, got it. Oh, a brown, a green, and a pink. Okay. Um, so Back of Chips is also on Board Game Arena. It's a super, super light. And again, this is a little bit of a shallow reason for this one, but... I think the game itself is pretty fun, but the fact that it comes in an actual bag kind of irks me because it doesn't fit nicely on my shelves. So, um, yeah, the style of game is not necessarily my personal favorite. Um, and because of that and because of the difficulty of storing it on my shelves, that's why it's in the cell pile. All right, and we have these weird little bulb pieces. Where are those? I don't see a bulb. Am I crazy? Oh, here it is. What's a weird one? Like a little bush or something? Um, underneath bag of chips, we have the um, Matchbox Collection Kickstarter. I have the playmats as well for it and the mini expansions. So um, this is one that I do have an extra of. Um, unfortunately, I bought the whole collection as a gift for a friend. However, we are no longer in contact, so <laughs> I have an extra copy sitting around. Um, if you're not familiar with the Matchbox collection, they are a series of five games that all have a little bit of a Euro-y style feel to them. Like some are card games, some have um, some extra like tokens and components, and they play at a variety of player counts. So from um, two players all the way to six, and every single one of them has a solo mode, which is pretty awesome. Um, I remember when it was first announced, I was super excited. This is one of the projects that I personally kickstarted way back in the day, um, and it's been a super fun one to have. Um, in fact, one of the ones that uh, focused on solo but has a two-player variant called EO um, was on my top 10 solo board games in 2022 list, I think. Um, it's a really solid one. The art for every single one is beautiful. Like they got Natalie Dumbois to do the art for Space Lunch, which is the six player, just like a set collection game with drinks and food. They had Sydney Chu, who's another fantastic artist, do the art for 15 days, which is about collecting different animals. It's just like a little card number order <laughs> kind of game. 
Um, there's Golems, which is a two player game, which has some interesting kind of resource management and multi use cards. And there is Rebus, which is another card game. And is that all five? I feel like I'm forgetting one, but I think those are the five. EO, Rebus, Golem, 15 Days, and Space Lunch. Yeah, so those are the five that come with it. Um, four of them have play mats as well. The production is really top notch. The back boxes themselves are just like little match boxes. Um, I mean, they're bigger than a matchbox, but they like slide out like a matchbox. So they're like the size of a soda can. <laughs> and um, yeah, so all five fit into that little like suitcase. Um, so yeah, those ones are staying in my collection. These are just the extra copies that I had anticipated giving as a gift and that is not happening anymore. So there they are. Let's see. So in the next skinning column, we have unlock. And this is the, oh gosh, I'm forgetting which adventure pack it is because I just unboxed a new one last night and my brain is thinking of that one, which is Extraordinary Adventures, but this is the one previous to that. Um, the Unlock games, if you're not familiar, are a series of room escape games. Um, they started publishing them in groups of three, which I think is just brilliant. So you have an easy, an intermediate, and then a challenge scenario. So you can kind of work your way up and each one has a unique story with sometimes some unique types of mechanics in them as well. Um, this particular pack that I just finished and I'm going to be selling has um, three scenarios. The first one is um, you're like <laughs> a race car driver, but you're actually a kid playing with their toys. So you're like going into the child's imagination and interacting with all the toys, but it's like a real life big map that you're in. Um, there's a Robin Hood scenario, which was super, super fun. And then there's a Sherlock Holmes case, which was one of the more challenging unlocks that I've done, I have to say. Um, but yeah, and that one's leaving because they're kind of one and done. So you play through them, you borrow them to friends, and then it's time to pass them on. Okay, moving on to column, we'll say four, because that's like a skinny column with those together. So on top we have Walk the Plank. Um, this is one that I absolutely love the art for. It's a really interesting take that card game where everybody programs a card and then reveals. So you're trying to push people off of the plank and feed them to the Kraken. <laughs> it's one that I know a lot of people really, really enjoy. For me, I think it's a little bit light for my taste, although I think the whimsical art and the um, theme are would appeal to a lot of people. I just get very anxious about <laughs> um, programming games and things like that. So that's why that one's leaving my collection. Um, I'm also looking here because it looks like these brown pieces should be the same color, but I only have a light brown of this little barrel piece. So let me see in the main instructions if we are supposed to have both. No, we are not, just the light brown, okay. So it just, the color, the coloration indicates otherwise, but I'm gonna go with that instead. <laughs> um, so next to Walk the Plank, we have Fafnir, which is an oink game. This is another one that I just happen to have an extra copy of. Um, it's a set collection game where you're gonna be bidding resources um, and trying to influence which resources will be worth points and which will be worth negative points. Um, so it's kind of interesting. It's similar to Colorado with the scoring where only, I think it's the three largest sets will score and then all the other colors will be worth negative. So you have like a little bidding screen and behind that you kind of uh, like program which uh, resources you're gonna ante up and then everybody reveals. And then over the course of a couple of rounds, you get to see um, which resources are worth how many points. So that one's actually really, really fun. And under that is Mantis Falls. So this is like right in the middle, big long beige box above Forbidden Island. Um, Mantis Falls is a two to three player social deduction game, which I was very intrigued by um, because I can very, uh, very much say that I have never played a two-player did social deduction game. Um, so I was intrigued. Um, 
upon trying it out, I don't necessarily think it's for me. I think the types of, well, in general, I'm not the biggest fan of social deduction, but I wanted to give this one a try um, because it seems so unique. Basically, you're going through um, the nights and you're collecting resources, trying to um, make sure your health doesn't drop, collecting allies and what have you, and interacting with your quote unquote partner, but they may not be a partner. <laughs> um let's see Ooh, this is a weird little piece here they may not be your partner they may actually be working against you and trying to sabotage you so um it's it was an interesting experience i don't necessarily think i quite grasped it but there wasn't enough there that appealed to my personal sensibilities for me to want to keep it around so that's why that one's leaving um Oh, I see. I was thinking, I don't see a piece that looks like a blindfold, but it's because these are stacked on top of one another. Uh, Mantis Falls, I believe, is also on Board Game Arena, so um, you can also try it there. It comes with a lot of mini expansions, though, the like actual physical copy of the game, which is pretty nice. So if you do get into it, there's a lot of replayability. And to be fair, I have heard that a lot of people have said it's one that you need to play a couple times to kind of get um the idea of but i just <laughs> i just don't necessarily have the patience for that um and again being that social deduction doesn't generally really appeal to me i think that this game would probably be better served in someone else's um library all right um under mantis falls we have forbidden island and then two under that is forbidden desert um these are cooperative games from matt leacock um, although I think both are very solid games, they've been in my collection for a super, super long time. Like since I got into the hobby years and years ago, I think it's time to finally retire them because we've kind of outgrown them in our game groups. Um, I'm not the hugest fan of cooperative games. And if I do want to play a cooperative game in that style, then we're usually going to end up playing Dead Men Tell No Tales instead which is um, a King Clanko cooperative game that uses a lot of the systems that um, Matt Leacock uh, implemented as far as like Pandemic and the Forbidden series goes, but with, in my opinion, a way cooler theme <laughs> and um, a little bit um, more mature of a theme and mature presentation and a little bit more challenge to it. Um, so that's, that's why those two are leaving um, again, super solid games, just I'm not the target demographic for them, um, no, nor is our game group. Uh, okay. Oh, whoops. I forgot. There's supposed to be one extra little piece in between here, making these little columns and we have to make four of them. So it, it would be important that they are all the same height. Um, sandwiched in between the Forbidden Games is Demeter. This is a flip and fill game from Sorry We Are French. I was originally really excited when this one was announced um, because it is based in the Ganymede universe, which is a um, an engine builder that I really love, um, designed by Hope Aswam. And I thought Demeter sounded really cool. It's about space dinosaurs. <laughs> like scientifically studying and then like breeding space dinosaurs and I thought man that seems pretty legit um but I wasn't sure about the dinosaur part it was also during the time that dinosaur games were starting to be really popular so it felt a little cash grabby for me in that regard but I hoped that the mechanics would kind of hold up um again I know that this one is a favorite for quite a few people but it just didn't grab me in the way that some other flip and fills do. One of the things is that I think um, typically with roll and writes where you have like the cross off get combos that feels good. But with flip and fills, I generally prefer ones where you can actually draw and like create something, use some more like shapes and tetramino pieces and things like that. So the fact that this one was a flip and fill where you were just checking stuff off, I think didn't feel as satisfying as some other games in the genre. Um, so 
yeah, unfortunately, um, that one's going to be leaving for me and it's out of print. So I figure there's definitely somebody who would appreciate it and enjoy the game a lot more than I have been. Um, especially since you can't really necessarily get it right now. Um, so I'm going to be letting that one go too. And on the very bottom of that middle column, we have Dead of Winter. Um, so this is the hidden rule game, semi-cooperative. And it's set in the um, zombie apocalypse. Pretty standard game. It was literally in the first order of games that I got from Amazon way, way back in the day when I first got into board gaming. Um, and <laughs> it's just one that we don't play quite as much. At one point, I had everything for it, minus some of the promos. And I wanted to try Warring Colonies very badly, which is where you have two teams of um, survivors that are pitted against one another. You can have like a lone wolf character. Um, and so it just combined a lot of things about the Dead of Winter universe that people enjoyed. But it's, um, oh, we have our first stickers here. Um, yeah, but we didn't end up ever getting to do it because like the full complement, I think was like 12 or 13 people and we never quite had that. So, um, unfortunately I never got to try that out. And I don't think <laughs> if I haven't so far, I don't think I will be anytime soon. So, um, I gave away The Longest Night, which is like the Dead of Winter sequel, and Warring Colonies, which goes along with that, but I still have a copy of the base game. I have a lot of fun memories of playing this, like super late at game nights and finding out who was the traitor and what have you, um, but it's just not a style of game that really appeals to me anymore, um, nor uh does it really will it does it really have like a <laughs> like we might play it maybe once a year but i'm sure there are groups that would play it like pretty regularly like once a month or what have you so it would probably be better served in someone else's collection for that reason oh my gosh the sticker's really hard to put on oh man okay i'm gonna focus on this sticker for two seconds and for anybody who is just showing up, thanks for joining live. Always good to get to hang out. And we're putting this five underneath. Five, five, six, six. Does it say which one? Five. Okay. Um, if there are any games that you're curious about or want more info about, let me know. Um, or if there are ones that you see that you're like, I don't know what that is, let me know as well. We're about halfway through the list. Okay. And this little window. Oh, no. Where did it go? There it is. Hmm? All right, so now we're moving on to this little skinny column. We'll start at the bottom. So next to Dead of Winter, we have Arctic Scavengers. Um, this is a deck building game with some kind of bidding um, in it as well. Oh, and we're making two of these windows. Oh, okay, okay. I should make sure that I'm actually popping them in the correct way. Um, Arctic Scavengers is a really interesting one because like I said, you have a little bit of bidding that's going on. Oh, of course I put it backwards. Um, so basically you can use cards on your turn in order to get resources or purchase new cards. Um, but there's also like a, I forgot what it's called, a pile, <laughs> a reward pile that you can go for um, at the end of each round. So you can withhold cards and then you reveal them to compare your strengths of your scavengers and whoever has the highest strength then gets to, um... oh, did I put this on right? Hold up. Nope, I did not. Okay. I need to switch this one too. Um... Yeah, whoever has the highest strength of scavengers then gets to, um... oh gosh, this is a hot mess, gets the uh, actual reward in the pile there. So it's an interesting one. Again, just don't play it that much. Um, and there is particularly one person in our group who's not the hugest fan of it, but it's kind of in the style of Dominion where you have like the set cards that come out, but then it has a variable market as well with those like, um, I forgot what they're called, they're like extra resource scavenger or something. So 
like the best of both worlds where you can plan ahead with your deck, but you also have a little variability um, even within the game itself because you don't know what those like will be and how they can impact your deck. Um, and there are different modules and things that you can put in as well. So it's kind of nice in that regard too. So it wants the this is correct. And this is correct? No, it's not. This is correct. With the little part and the little window with the red. And then and this one has to be rotated around because I didn't check which side because I thought they were the same. So that's Arctic Scavengers. Um, above that, on the left, we have Lost Cities Rival. So there are quite a few Lost Cities games. Um, Lost Cities, the card game, is the two-player card game, which I personally really love. Um, Lost Cities Rivals is similar, where you're trying to play cards in order from low to high, but this has a crucial step of bidding on the cards before they come up. Um, and I'm not sure how I'm supposed to get this one this piece off because there's nothing grippable. Oh no. <laughs> um, so Lost Cities Rivals, like I said, has a little bit of bidding in it, which is not my favorite mechanic in games. So that's why that one's leaving. I would rather play the Lost Cities card games, although Rivals does play up to four. There's also a Lost Cities board game, which I've never played, and a Lost Cities Roll and Write, which I've also never played. Um, so I can't speak about to those, but that's where we're at with those ones. Um, and then we have, oh, actually, wait, this one, no, it's the wrong way. <laughs> the little tab is in the back. Um, and above Lost Cities, we have Cleocatra, which is a super cute game. Um, it is a tile laying game with little Egyptian kitties. Um, it's definitely a family game, so meant for younger audience or people who enjoy lighter games um, and unfortunately tiling is not one of my favorite aspects of gaming i don't mind tiling when it's used in conjunction with other things but when it's the main focus or kind of only focus that's not usually my cup of tea um, and although the art is very cute and i love the theme um, i can't justify keeping it just as a collection piece when it could be out there getting played <laughs> So that one's Cleat Capture. Above that, we have two extra Matchbox collection games. So like I said, I always buy them when I see a cheap set because they make great gifts. Um, and these are two that haven't been able to find a home yet. And next to those, we have the expansions for Oh My Goods. Which, oh, I love Oh My Goods so much. It's a little card game with multi-use cards, very Euro-y. Um, I'm going to start on these next windows and you have like a little bit of push your luck where each day and night everybody's going to get a pool of common resources so you see all of the morning resources that you're going to get and then you kind of program what you're going to play and then you get your evening resources which are randomized each game it's until you have a certain number number of symbols showing um, out of the cards that are revealed and um yeah it's just really tight engine building the cards are multi-use so you can use them to discard for resource you can use them to gain money like the backsides are money um or no to gain money you can use them um to denote how many resources you're producing of each type um you can use them for their actual building which you can construct um, it's a really solid game. I just don't play it enough to justify having both expansions, which also add a campaign mode, which I'm a little allergic to. Um, so the, I think it's Long's Brick and Oak, and I don't remember what they're called, but it's the two expansions for Oh My Goods, those little blue boxes. And directly on top of those, so in the middle from Arctic Scavengers, then you go up, 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 up. We have that like white box um, with the black in the middle, which is Prophecy. This is a relatively new um, trick-taking game that came out, published by ELO. And it's interesting because um, you have your cards to start out, 
And based on the cards that you have in hand, you actually have to use those to bid on how many tricks you think you're gonna win. Now, part of me is just maybe a little salty because I'm notoriously bad at these bid on how many tricks, tricks you think you're gonna win games. <laughs> um, but it's an interesting one because I've never seen it where you have to wager cards that you have in order to accomplish that. So you have a little bit more um, control over the cards that you'll have and get to play throughout the um, each hand or throughout the round, I should say. Um, but I have a lot of trick taking games at this point. I have quite a few of these. Um, see how many you can bid on. And I think out of the ones that I have, Prophecy didn't uh, grab me quite as much as some of the other ones. I think mostly due in part to the fact that it seemed to run a little bit long comparatively. At least it felt a little bit longer in my mind. But again, super unique with how you can um, use cards in your hand and kind of cull which cards you want to keep and which ones you want to get rid of in order to bid on how many tricks you think you'll win. So props for that. And above Prophecy, we have Skowentir, um, which is a game from Inpatience Games, which is Shadi Torbay's publishing company. Um, oh, what's happening here? These go nine, eight, one of each. Oh, were we not supposed to do two? I'm a little confused. Oh yeah, okay. So nine is the white. And then we have eight, which is the other one. Um, This is a cooperative game. It plays from one to four players. I got it anticipating that I would be playing it solo a lot. Um, But I think as a multiplayer game, it wasn't mm, captivating enough. Like there wasn't enough difference of what you could do versus your opponents or to interact with your opponents um to where to what I, at least for what i would like to see in a cooperative game um and as a solo game it was very light like i generally like my solo games to be pretty punishing um so the fact that this one was relatively easy i kind of felt like mm, there might be some other games that i would enjoy playing more in my time solo but I do think it was an interesting puzzle of moving around different cards, picking up cards at certain times. Um, the theme is that you are trying to avoid like the the devil of the forest. I forgot what their name is in um, the folklore, but I thought it was really interesting thematically. Um, I believe it's based on Danish folklore. Um, and it had a lot of really great notes, amazing art, and it just the cooperative <laughs> uh realm of games is not just is just one that i'm not particularly inclined to enjoy as much and um yeah so that's why that one's leaving and on top of skull and tear we have oh it's hard for me to see what that is actually what is that in the center Is that Lugu? It might be Lugu. Um, so this is the second copy that I have of this game. It's a fun storytelling game, um, kind of similar to like Once Upon a Time, if you're familiar with that or anything. Um, but basically you get some cards with abstract, um, ge very geometric art on them. And you then have to um, make up a story with the cards that you get in what order you get them in. And then everybody else has to try to program which cards they are. And like with many games of this style, you want to make sure that you are um, giving enough clues so that other people can deduce which particular cards you've uh, received, but you don't want everybody to get it where it's too obvious. So it's a really fun storytelling type of game. Um, it's not my usual cup of tea, but this one does it really well. So I always enjoy playing it um, when we have a larger group who's more inclined to be into kind of some creative storytelling like that. Okay, and now on top of Arctic Scavengers, uh, the big blue box in the middle, but on the right side we have No Time. Um, and 
We're about halfway done with the game list. We're almost halfway done. Oh, uh, well, maybe a little bit less than halfway done with the build. So we'll see how that goes. Um, so Snow Time is a... It really kind of feels like a kid's game, <laughs> but you're going to be programming to climb up a tree, um, like different cards, and then like doing a simultaneous reveal. Oops, I forgot to put the sticker on. Um, it's a very... I love the art and aesthetic of the game, um, but in terms of the actual gameplay, it's very, very light. And um, being that I'm not a child and don't have children, usually end up playing games with people who are fairly well acquainted with games. Um, it's a it's a weight of game that's not going to hit the table, although the meeples are some of my favorites that I've ever seen. Oh my gosh, they are adorable. <laughs> um, but yeah, unfortunately, uh, just because a game has nice components and really great art doesn't necessarily mean that it should stay in the collection when it can be played by other people who will appreciate it more. So that's why Snow Time's leaving. Um, and above that, we have Gobi, another gorgeous game. This one's a tiling game where you're going to be making, placing out tiles and placing your camels on them and um, trying to create routes between different types of goods with your camels. Um, again, tiling is a main mechanic. I don't know, it's not really for me. And the game is pretty light with that collection. You can either go for points or you can go for um, some treasures, which kind of boost your capabilities and actions um, throughout the game. But again, uh, the replayability with it, it feels pretty samey from play to play. And being that it's pretty light, it's not necessarily one that's um, I am able to justify keeping. So there's that. We need a, these column ones. Above Gobi, we have the black box, which is lock and key based on the comic of the same name. I believe the comic is uh, created by um, Stephen King's son, or is it Stephen King? Stephen King? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but it is a like programming simultaneous reveal type of game. So you're going to have um, it almost feels like a trick taking game, but it's not trick taking. So you have a card. It's semi cooperative where everybody is going to try to contribute to that particular suit of card and reach a certain threshold. Um, and based on whether you do or not, you're going to be able to then um, gain a benefit if you play like the highest or lowest cards etc um there are keys that you can get which are like really powerful abilities they are like secondary prizes so sometimes you don't want to have the best card and win sometimes you want to have like the second best card to get the better bonus um yeah it's uh oh i see it's one that i got relatively early on i actually got it from the first like board game garage sale that i went to from my local game store and i played it quite a bit back in the day but it doesn't really get played anymore unfortunately so that's why that one's on there and then we have this piece and a little clear piece <laughs> um uh-oh uh -oh. there it is okay Above lock and key, there is a copy of, oh, so, 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 mm, what is it called? <laughs> oh, I'm blanking on the name. Studies and Sorcery. There we go. <laughs> um, so Studies and Sorcery is an engine building game. It has a solo mode, which I've heard is really fantastic. I haven't gotten to try it solo, um, but it plays, the base game plays up from one to four players. And it's about creating potions um like getting resources etc there's like different scoring phases based on like the phase of the moon so if you're into like witchy games uh i think the theme is pretty cool it didn't quite appeal to me as much um even though i do love engine building so again i think it's a fact of especially if i'm going to be playing something primarily solo then I really want the game to really appeal to my sensibilities. Whereas with some other games, um, that's maybe, um, 
aren't my favorite theme, but I like mechanically. I can justify keeping them because people that I play them with might really enjoy being like a witch and creating potions. Um, so that one is going to be leaving my collection too. And above that, we have Slap 45. This is a speed dexterity game that I got really, really early on. Um, it is kind of like um, Egyptian rat screw or like taco cat goat cheese pizza where you flip over a car and everybody has to react. This one has a really fun theme though. So you're playing in the wild west and um, <laughs> if it's like a gun, you have to slap the gun and then, and then point at someone else like finger guns <laughs> as fast as you can. But instead of going for the gun card to shoot someone, you can slap into your base for safety. Um, but if you slap into your own home base, it might be faster. But if you slap into someone else's and they slap after you, then they don't get the shelter of their base and then they can get shot. Um, it's kind of wacky and kind of crazy. Uh, the last time we played it, it was kind of recently, um, but it was a little bit too chaotic, I think, for the people that um, I typically play with regularly. So um, even though it's pretty fun and it's pretty unique for a slapping game, um, that one's going to be leaving as well. Oh no, this is not centered. I bought a little tiny sticker for the, for the ramen shop. And this is going to be in the front, so I want it to be centered as much as possible. And above Slap 45, I have um, two Japanese games. Izayoi and... Um, oh, what's the other one called? Shoot, I'm blanking on the name. Um, I believe the translation is Humble Tea Party. Um, these are both really beautiful, interesting games having to do with tiling. Humble Tea Party is about collecting different gifts, but you want to be humble. You don't want to have the most exorbitant um, bag at the end. <laughs> um, so you're like taking gifts for yourself and then gifting them to other players. Um, it's an interesting concept, but it was fairly light. And Izayoi is similar where you're going to be accumulating different um, accessories that you can then score. But um, you have like a hidden master and you don't want to have more points than they have. So there's like a little bit of like hidden roll kind of a vibe in there as well. Um, so both of them have gorgeous presentations and they're very unique. But uh, despite that, I feel like they're definitely more in my collection as collector's pieces than they are for their actual gameplay and how much we would play them. So both Izayoi and Humble Tea Party are going to be leaving. Um, I got them originally in a BGG auction, um, and I was glad to be able to try them out and to show them off to people, but I think uh, <laughs> they've kind of... Um, they're kind of at the end of their novelty um, as far as that goes. Okay, let's see. These are kind of hard to get positioned in the right spots because they need to be centered. I should have started with the one in the center first, honestly, for these little flags instead of trying to push them all after the fact, but I think they're pretty much centered now. We'll see. Okay, um, and then we need the banner. So we're going to put those on here. Um, so that completes that stack and we're on to the final two stacks. So second to last stack on the right here, we'll start with that one. Oh no, the sticker's crooked. <laughs> um, so from the top of the stack, we have One Night Ultimate Werewolf. Um, many of you are probably familiar with this game, but it is a variation of the game Werewolf where everybody has a hidden role. People go to sleep. Um, things happen in the night and then you have to try to deduce who the werewolves are and get them out or if you're a werewolf you have to try to pass yourself off as a villager to survive um it is one of the like quintessential hidden role games i've already kind of said how i feel about hidden role games and i thought you know but having one night ultimate werewolf it's one of the classics it's good to have in case people want to play it um, but the last time we played it, we ran into the scenario of people wanting to play it again and again. 
and I realized very quickly that my patience was very low for that. Um, so I think rather than have it around, um, there are a lot of other games that we can play instead. So I'm cycling that one out of the collection. And if there's somebody that wants to play it at like a big game night or something or an event, um, I'm sure that other people have a copy as well. So it's not on me to like house it 365 days out of the year um, so that other people can maybe play it when they come over. At least that was my thought process on that. Um, all right. And the next game under that is Cristallo. Um, this is a solo tiling game, and it's one that a lot of people really like. Based on everything that I like and other games that I like of a similar type, like Orchard and Grove, Rolopolis, like solo, small tiling games, I feel like I should like this one a lot more. But for whatever reason, I just have not been able to really get into it. Um... Yeah, I've heard that there's an expansion potentially coming out for it. I don't know what that changes, but for some reason, this one for me, I played it on stream a while back when I first started streaming on Twitch. Um, and it was relatively okay then, but since then I've rarely ever touched it. Um, and I think, like I said, ooh, it is a favorite for a lot of people. I think there are a lot of people that would enjoy it much more than I would, than I do. Um, so that one is up for grabs as well. Okay. Maybe we'll just be able to get half of this little house done by the time I'm finished going through the games here. Let's see. This little... There we go. Okay, so we have our banners now for the fronts. Um, underneath Cristalo is Moku Tower. This is a dexterity game. Um, <laughs> and... Oh boy, it is an interesting one. So in Moku Tower, you're going to be, you have like these wooden blocks that are ge various geometric shapes. Um, and along with that, you get these challenges of how you need to stack them. So certain types of blocks and, uh oh, I feel like I'm missing one of these brown pieces various types of, there it is, <laughs> various types of blocks. And um, they're all wooden, so you have like a little platform that you balance them on and then you stack the blocks, but they're not uniform shapes. Um, so it's pretty interesting, but unlike a lot of balancing types of games, this one's pretty different in that there's a speed element. So you're trying to wage your bets on how many of the things you think you can complete in a certain amount of time um, in order to get points or more points than your opponents. But um, yeah, the riskier it is, the more of a chance that you're gonna run out of time on the sand timer and not get any points at all. In concept, I think it's a cool idea but the refinement of the pieces and of the stacking doesn't seem to match the kind of chaotic energy that you get of doing different types of stacking maneuvers with some of the card draws so i'm not really sure kind of um uh oh i put these backwards i'm not really sure what the thought process was there with the design because like i said it feels very, I mean, it's certainly not what other games have done. So there is that, but <laughs> at the same time, um, it's, it's, uh, it didn't quite m meet my expectations for either of the two. Like if it was going to be a totally silly game, then it sh I feel like I would love to have just a totally silly game. And if it was going to be like a refined, nice stacking game, and balancing game, then I would rather focus on that aspect versus the timed aspect of it. So um, it was a little bit of, there was a little bit of a disconnect there for me, at least in terms of um, what I would like to see with that style of game. And on top of Moku or under Moku Tower, we have Sea of Clouds. So this is a drafting game where you have three piles of cards. It's kind of similar to Canopy if you've ever played that. So, um, 
you have a single card that you can, or the first pile, you flip it over. If you don't want it, you add a card to it face down. You push your luck. Look at the second pile of face down cards. You can look at then a third pile of face down cards. And then if you don't take any of them, then you get like a random card draw. Um, and like I said, it's similar to Canopy, which I really enjoy Canopy and the theme and presentation of it with like the rainforest animals and Vincent Du Trait art is much more appealing to me than this very like pirate cartoony type of game. So even though it's a solid game with solid gameplay, I have a game that's similar that I like better aesthetically. Um, and that's why I'm going to be letting go of Sea of Clouds. I will say though that Sea of Clouds does have one thing that Canopy doesn't have, and that is comparing the strength values of your pirates and your crew each round to get additional treasure. So um, there is that that's a little bit different, but if I want a game that's like that, where you're comparing strength values to people on your right and left, then typically I want to play something like Paper Tales, which is a little weightier. Um, so that's why that one is leaving. And we're on to step 13 here, I believe. Oh man, that's a lot of layers of stuff. And we're up onto the second floor. This is what we have so far. Got like the little entryway with our sign, some like window advertisements. And then we've got the back as well with the little flap here. Okay. Um, underneath Sea of Clouds, we have Explorers. <laughs> so this is a Phil Walker Harding flip and fill game. And a lot of people love it. And I wanted to love it too, but I do not. Um, it's kind of similar to Silver and Gold, which is another Phil Walker Harding flip and fill game. Um, but this one, you're like crossing off boxes based on filling out your map and different types of terrain. And I don't know, it just did not grab me. I gave it a lot of different tries and it doesn't stick, hasn't stuck with me yet. Um, I would have to think on it more to figure out exactly why that might be. Um, but my main gut instinct is that I would rather just play silver and gold, which is very straightforward. Um, oh no, these are like facing different ways, whoops. I did not even realize that. We want all the horizontal striped ones. Some of these are vertical. Um, but yeah, and with Explorers, you're like racing to get to different sides of the maps. There's some variable scoring for each game. So you have like gems, um, food, horses and things. And each game they can change what they do, um, which should be great for replayability. But if <laughs> you don't really like the base game quite as much, then replayability doesn't really matter because I don't feel like I want to play it again and again and again and again, again and again and again. So there's that, unfortunately. Um, speaking of unfortunate, oh, there's the other horizontal. Got it. <laughs> um, and under Explorers is Wayfarers. This is a pick up and deliver game. Um, this one was just too simple for me. It's from Pandasaurus Games, so the production quality is really excellent. You've got like your little biplanes and your runway. Um, the way that you get resources with them, like you have different runways, so you can like stack them up. Um, there's a little bit of a like timed mechanic there with which, which resources are taken when. Um, it's interesting, but again, it felt pretty light. And pick up and deliver is not necessarily one of my favorite mechanics. In fact, I can't really think of a lot of games that have that mechanic, um, at least in my collection, other than maybe like broom service. Um, so perhaps that's part of the reason why I didn't enjoy this one as much. Um, but regardless of if it's a, like a, an objective or a subjective one, um, it's not staying in the collection. And then we're moving on to the last stack of games here. So on top, we have Go Nuts for Donuts. Speaking of light games, wow, <laughs> this is a bidding game where you're going to be trying to collect donuts. Everybody chooses a number, like one through whatever number based on your player count. And then you reveal, if you reveal the same number as somebody else, then nobody gets that donut. But if you're the only one to vote on a particular donut, you get it. It's super cute, super straightforward, but Again, I just don't see myself playing it or people that I know really wanting to play it. Um, I kept it as like, a, oh, if we need a super light game because we have like people over who don't play games a lot. Um, 
I kept it for that reason, but then I realized, wait, we don't really have people over who don't play games a lot. Um, or if we do, like there are other games that we could certainly play that are maybe a little bit more engaging. Um, so that one's gotta go. And under that we have Le Cirque. So um, this one I didn't realize, but it's not even really like a game game. Um, it's a dexterity kind of challenge that you can somewhat turn into a game. It's got really cool chunky wooden pieces. I showed it on my unboxing stream a couple months ago. We've had an interesting time messing around with it, but I definitely think it would be cool as like a little art puzzle to have out on a table. Or if you have like kids, um, it would be a really cool puzzle for them to be able to play with. Um, but I do not have kids and I do not have a little side table that I can just have puzzles out on. So <laughs> space is at a premium. Um, so that one's gonna be leaving as well. And let's see, here we go. Under or to the right of Le Cirque, all the way on the right, tiny little oink game box so in it is a speed game where you're trying to match cards with either one or um one more or one less item than the previous card played um i have quite a few speed games that are similar to this and with zogan the cards are pretty tiny so it's a it's a little unwieldy to kind of hold on to um although i really love the art and the little characters are very endearing i just think there are other speed games similar to it that I would rather play. And under that is Passengers, another social deduction game. Are y'all sensing a theme here? Um, so as far as that goes, social deduction, not really my bag. Um, Passengers was a really unique one though. I'm glad I got to try it out. So you have two ships each round um, and each team is going to be placing them on them. So they're like the soul um, farriers who are trying to get as many human souls into the afterlife. And then there are the demons who are trying to like corrupt the souls that are going to your life on the boat. Um, and so with that, um, you're going to like secretly be programming different souls and then voting on which boat is actually going to progress. Um, so it's a very unique theme. There's a lot of nuance with like the specific, um, cards that you take each round, because in addition to granting you a unique ability and priority in the turn, um, they will also grant you like little, uh, I forgot what they're called, like little wisps <laughs> that are your voting power for which boat gets to go into the afterlife. So it's not like a one-to-one, -one, everybody gets a singular vote. Um, it's based on the power of the item that you take, how much influence you'll have, um, or which boat is actually going to progress. Um, so a lot of really interesting mechanics there, but again, playing it, I realized, whoa, this is cool from a de design perspective, but it's not necessarily something that I really want to be playing. Um, so that's why that one's leaving. And we have three more games. Woo -wee! So all the way on the right, the yellow game is Spellbook. Um, this one's also on Board Game Arena, I think, um, as of recently, but Spellbook um, is a little bit of an engine building game where you're going to be getting rune stones that help you learn spells um, at progressive difficulties. But you kind of have to hedge your bets because if you learn an easy version of a spell, then you can't level it up for later and get more points for it or a stronger power. Um, so it's a little bit of a race to see who can um, accumulate the best like combination of spells the quickest and get the most points um, before the end of the game is triggered um there's some variability with the different spells and things like that but overall it didn't feel very thematic it felt very abstract to me um and even again with the theme it wasn't one that appealed to me a lot i had heard a lot of good things about it when it first came out and i do think that the component quality is very nice like the little um, spell tokens themselves are have like an acrylic finish on them, but, or rune tokens, sorry, not spell tokens. Um, but overall, I don't know, there wasn't a whole lot to it. <laughs> and there are a lot of different, um, oh, 
it seems I have made a mistake with laying down. Oh, did those go on top? Those go on top. Interesting. Okay, glad I caught that. <laughs> um, so like with your spells and things, I just, I don't know. It felt very abstract. It felt very back and forth. And the part of it that should have been cool with the timing of like pushing your luck with um, which levels of spells you win, it seemed pretty straightforward. Um, the later, like more challenging spell combinations that you can use for cards might change that up a bit. But as the, like, as the concept went for the base game, it wasn't really appealing to me. And so I wasn't too inclined to want to try more of those. Okay. Then we have this here. And then we have this little like sushi bar. Ooh, cute. So it's two of the threes. All right, and the last game at the very bottom, oh uh, no, second to last game, we have Catacomb Cubes. This one's been in my collection for quite a while. Um, I'm sad to see it go, but it just doesn't get played. Um, it is a building game where you're gonna be drafting um, three-dimensional pieces and breaking them down, building them together in order to construct various buildings that you then place out on a grid and based on where you place them, you can get different bonuses and scorings. Um, it's got a lot of really cool elements, but I think like the 3D building aspect of it, I have some games that also have that like Mega City Oceania, which is a little bit more, a little bit less rigid feeling in terms of the components themselves because they're not necessarily, um, whatchamacallit, uh, cubes, <laughs> that's the word. They're not really cubes, they're actually rather, um, just like kind of freeform pieces. Um, and with those, you also put them into like a big central grid as well. So I personally really like catacomb, um, cubes, but we don't play it. <laughs> so, um, there's not as much enthusiasm from other members of the group or not enough to warrant it, I think. And typically when we end up playing spatial reasoning types of games, um, we tend to gravitate towards like two dimensional tetramino types of games. Um, so I don't know, it's cool to have the variety with it, but it's also quite a large box to keep around for a game that we don't play super regularly. Um, so that's why that one's leaving. Oh, and then we have these pieces here. Cool, it's coming together. Second floor is looking good. I like the little flowers too, sprinkled throughout. It's pretty nice. Little sushi bar. All right, and the last game, Ishtar, um, Gardens of Babylon. So, um, this game is, I think, is it a Pernicopala game, I think? I'm not sure, it's been a long time. Um, it's got some route building and area control where you're placing pieces out around fountains. You've got some different abilities that you can kind of upgrade as you go throughout the game. Um, it's an all right game, I would say. Uh, it feels like there are a lot of things that should be cool about it, like the rondelle kind of selection for drafting your tiles, but overall tiling, area control-ish type route building isn't necessarily my jam, um, so that's why that and and this one it feels i don't know i think for what it is for me personally it felt like it was over as we were just getting started oh it's like a little seating booth that's cute um so i don't know i didn't enjoy it as much as i would have liked i think the first couple times i played it i was quite enamored with it and then upon su subsequent plays later i didn't I wasn't feeling it quite as much. Um, so that's why that one's leaving. Oof. Um, so yeah, that is all of the games <laughs> that are leaving in this latest call. Um, again, it, it's, uh, it took quite a while <laughs> to get to that point. I had some of these pulled and then just recently went through again and, uh, Pro tip, <laughs> if you are looking to cull games, 
it's a good thing to do when you're like annoyed or angry because all of the like sentimental oh but we had such good times kind of go out the window when you're frustrated about other things at least for me um it helps me think a little bit more objectively about it than emotionally and just thinking about like clearing out the clutter so that's how we arrived at this selection of games again a lot of games that just the mechanics for me aren't necessarily ones that um i enjoy quite as much and there are some games in there that i do really enjoy i just happen to have the extra copies of them so i'm trying to clear up space <laughs> and not hoard a bunch of games unnecessarily um tr keyword trying so those will hopefully be leaving and getting to collections where they can actually be played um, more uh, regularly. So yeah, um, if you're watching live or in the future, thanks for tuning in. Um, if you're interested in any of these games, um, like I said, at this point, I'm not looking to like make bank off of them. I just want them to go to homes where <laughs> they're gonna be enjoyed. So um probably we'll figure out some cheap pricing for you and cheap shipping um if there are any that you're interested in or if you have more questions about them feel free to reach out in the comments hit me up on instagram on discord on board game geek any or all of the above and uh hopefully those will be entering other collections soon um i'm just gonna finish up this little back wall here really quickly Let's see, how does this go? So we want it to be like this, I think. Okay. And then I'll probably end up fixing the rest of this up on stream. Um, but we've got a good decent amount of the second floor here. This little seating arrangement. I like these little ice cream swirls or mochi swirls, whatever they are. Um, so we'll just need to put a roof on there, it looks like. Yeah, which the roof is like the most tedious part. <laughs> oh, it's like a top balcony little area. Oh, and the ramen. All right, so I'll be doing that probably off stream, A, because it's getting to be food time for the bunnies, and B, because this room is getting very warm, which I'm glad for the warmer weather, no complaints there, but <laughs> being in a tiny room with a lot of lights, it's definitely, whoo, it's getting a little spicy, so. Uh, thanks as always for joining me and I'll see you next time. Bye.